Welcome out of church, everybody. Welcome if you're watching on the live stream. We're going to worship our God tonight. Let's sing along. Let's all stand and pray as well. Let's sing my Savior. Praise you for you saved my soul. Thank you. 
before a God who cares. We want to come before a God who is faithful. We want to come before a God who loves us. And we want to... Uh, bring our need before him and uh, there's just a number of things that we can pray for. I want to pray, we prayed recently for Adelina's cousin Joe and uh, mentioned that when we went over to Bustleton, um, haven't seen him, hasn't been in church over 20 years, he came along to a service and he's been coming along each Sunday um, since then and, and he said to me at the time, he said, I'm coming back, Pete, I'm coming back and uh, so he, he went to church, gave his life to Jesus this morning. And, uh, and prayed a prayer and uh, and was weeping at the altar and the guys like he's worked on sort of road gangs and all sorts of things all over WA and he's a you know he's a tough sort of guy and lovely guy but um you know he was uh, really really moved. Pastor Farrell prayed the sinner's prayer with him and he said as part of the prayer he thanked God for his faithfulness that he never left Joe during this time and he said as soon as he said that it's like the Holy Spirit just went boom and and, uh, and Joe just started to weep realizing and recognizing that God has never left me all these years of, of Joe left God and uh, lived his own life and walked away for a season but God was faithful and brought him back and thank God for that thank God for his goodness but I want to pray for Joe pray for his wife Kerry she's been in church she's been faithful living for Jesus the whole time and being faithful to her husband and loving him um, despite where he's been at spiritually and so I want to pray for them and we continue to pray for Adelina pray for her dad Jeff <coughs> Pray for my sister Jen, her husband Murray, he's down for down in New, he's going to have an operation on his foot tomorrow, pray that goes well. And um, just the grace of God upon them, the grace of God, you're reaching out to somebody that uh, God's, uh, you're, you're believing, you're hoping God's going to move in your family, he is. And he's faithful and he, he hears your prayer and he loves people and he wants to save them and um, continue and maybe right now just pray for them, pray for somebody in faith this, morning, uh, this evening believe in God. Let's pray. God, speak something to me. Speak something to my heart through the sermon. And uh, you may not understand everything that's preached, but there'll be something that God will speak. There'll be something that God will bring that he's brought you here tonight for. Let's pray. Let's take time and do that. I want to pray for people tuning in on the live stream that God will touch lives. God will help people. Let's take time and pray. Can you bend open us uh, in a word of prayer in just a moment? Wonderful God. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing in our midst, Lord. We know that you're faithful. God, we know that you hear our prayers, Lord God. We know that you love our family members, God, more than we love them, Lord God. We pray that you save them, Lord God, and particularly those maybe that have vaccinated once knew you, but they've fallen back, Lord God, slipped back, fallen away, Lord God. We pray, God, you handle Joe and carry it on. Uh, Jen and Murray and Jeff and Carl and Adelina Father today we're lifting up by God the meetings right now Lord God we've got the conference coming up in the press stop next week Lord we hear the grace of the Lord Father breakthrough ministry God we ask Father you speaking to people providing for needs for the furtherance of uh, the gospel for the new churches to be grown to start off Lord God God that would translate that would People being saved that aren't saved today, God, we thank you for part of your work, God, God, the wonderful work that you've done. We thank you for the life into those situations, God, that you breathe into God, into our own lives, God, as we witness, God, we have reached God through goodness, and which is demonstrated in the salvation of Joe, Lord God, your faithfulness, your willingness, none should perish, Lord God. Mighty God, as we go out onto the streets, as we pray for people, Lord God, Lord, we do pray that they will come to that realization, your love for them. My God, help that to come uh, from our church, Lord God, and course through the streets of this city that would draw people, Lord God, your love, your spirit. Lord God, lift up all the people with sickness, Lord God, and situations in their life, that you would smooth those things over and allow people to be in church, Lord God. Almighty God, we lay these things in your hands out gratefully, Lord God, that we can give them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wonderful God. Great to see you in church tonight. Take a moment to greet somebody. A couple of announcements, just want to let you know there's a calendar out there uh, for July and uh, you can grab that. There's a few things we've got coming up. If you read on there that it says that there's a church camp or a scout camp next week, and it's not, it's been uh, postponed until next year. And so that's a good thing because who knows how cold or rainy or otherwise it's going to be. And so uh, a couple of things just want to remind you. On the 15th, there's a, a home group this Friday. It's just for the young crew. And so I just want to remind them, be praying for that. We're planning to fast and pray on Friday that uh, God can use us and give us strategy to reach our friends and uh, whoever, family. But uh, with the gospel, I want to uh, believe God for that one. And 
there's an outreach on this Saturday. There's a concert on Sunday night. This time next week, Sunday night, there's a concert. And uh, all of these things I'm talking about, they're all opportunities for somebody. There's opportunities for, for you and me to invite somebody. The opportunities for them, but we want to invite people. So with that in mind, we want to do some outreach this Saturday, 10 o'clock. Meet down the building, half past 10, go out in the street and uh, set up the band, play some music as a promo and, uh, and preach the gospel and let people know about Jesus, invite people to come out for that encouragement. Be praying about that. Who can I invite? And uh, be bold and step out and just invite folks. Say, hey, this is a concert. It's good. Come out. Hear, hear some good news about Jesus. That's on uh, next Sunday night. Um, home groups for uh, both the A and the B team, as I mentioned this morning. That's on next Friday, Friday the 22nd. That's uh, next Friday, Friday week. And, uh, and then on the 23rd Saturday night, there's a rally down in the Parramatta Church with Pastor Greg Farrell. He's my pastor and he's been my pastor for many, many years and really appreciate him and uh, all that God's done in his life and done in and through his ministry. And uh, he's a great preacher, a great expositor of what the Bible says. He really nails many times things that it's just like, oh, gee, it's clear now that he said that. <laughs> and it really, really still helps me to this day. I encourage you, if you're able to go down there, it'll be a great scene. Um, that's Saturday the 23rd. Praise God. We can take an offering for the work of God here in the church. Appreciate your giving. Appreciate those you give online. And uh, God's good. Praise God. Can we get to you to pray? Father God, we thank you, God, for the blessings on our lives, God, and your, your miracle provisions, God. God, I pray tonight you bless the gift and giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Ephesians 5, we're going to look there in just a moment. I was reading an article during the week. It's by uh, an article uh, by a journalist um, by the name of Stan Grant. Maybe you know who he is, maybe you don't, but it's an ABC article. And he talks about the census, the re recent census in Australia. And the article, the heading of the article is, The census shows that Australians are becoming less religious. But why have we chosen to live without God? And so he's a little bit of a, you know, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's an op-ed, it's an opinion, it's, it's, uh, he's a bit of a philosopher in a sense, but he's a, he's a very smart man. But uh, he says this: uh, Nietzsche was right, God is dead, and we've killed him. That's what the latest census tells us. The number of faithless, this is in Australia, is closing in on the number of faithful. And he makes this comment, he says, In my lifetime I've seen Australia change from being an almost completely Christian country to one where now just 44% practice Christianity. I'm not sure if 44% practice Christianity, probably 44% ticket on the box, the box on the census, if that's practicing Christianity. I don't know. I'm not there. God knows what sort of practicing people are doing. But one man said this, the, the church has lost its influence because Christians have neglected their responsibility to be the light or to be light in the world. And uh, as we have, as in the church, I'm not talking about anyone specifically, but as we've neglected to be what God's called us to be, maybe become too comfortable, maybe become too focused on the here and now, um, the Western world particularly um, has decided to ignore us. And in Western nations, Christianity numbers wise, in all sorts of uh, indicators, census, and uh, you know how many people attend church services and stuff, it's on the decline in, in the Western world. That's a, that's a reality. Author G. Campbell Morgan, famous Christian author, remarked that the church did most for the world when the church was least like the world. And so today, the modern church, to some degree, has become very much uh, similar to the culture, similar even in morality to the culture we're part of, rather than being separate to the degree that the Bible would call us to be separate or different to the degree that the Bible would call us to act differently. And so Jesus said we're the light of the world. We're meant to be a, a reflection of him. And again, one of his pictures is a lamp on a stand. That's, that's a picture of what a Christian is, a lamp on a stand. And so I want to minister a, a simple message tonight from Ephesians 5, a light in the darkness, a light in the darkness. Listen to what the Bible says, and this is written to Christians, written to believers. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. In other words, you were once not a Christian and your, and your, your morality was very much shaped by your family and your culture. Um, 
And some of the things you did was, was you were just living in darkness, in ignorance, spiritual darkness, in ignorance of what was right and wrong. And uh, But now you have light from the Lord. And because you have light from the Lord, live as people of light. Verse 9, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for the Holy Spirit producing good things in our heart. And, uh, you know, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. That's a key scripture there. It's a, it's a life scripture. It's like if we will carefully consider and determine what pleases God, that's, that's what a Christian is. We want to please God. Verse 11, take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it's said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I remember when God began to convict my heart of my sin. Um, it's like there was a light came on. It was like God's searchlight was exposing to me what was really happening in my life. I thought I was a pretty good bloke, you know. I thought I was a good person. And uh, if anyone said, you're a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. Do you think you'll go to heaven? Well, uh, I'm probably good enough, you know. I'm better than most people, I think. And when the Holy Spirit began to convict me of who I really was, my the evil that was within me, the attitudes that were within me, the, the selfishness and the pride and the greed and, you know, not necessarily gross things. I wasn't robbing banks or, you know, doing all sorts of other heinous things. But there was things in my life that were not pleasing to God. They were not right before God. And to the point that I felt when I was in a church service like this, I felt like everyone else knew. I felt like there was a spotlight on me and everyone else was looking at me going, man, they check that dude in the back row. Like, it's, he's got something going on in his life. And that's how I felt. I felt exposed by the light. But it was the light of Christ, but it was doing an inner search. It wasn't exposing me before anybody else, but it was exposing me before me. It was showing me in the mirror who I really was. And it's like, whoa. And I began to understand because of the light of Christ in my life. It's like, man, I, 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 need, I need to change some stuff and I need to be saved. I need a saviour. I need God's help because I didn't realise how bad it was. You know, it's interesting. You know, my father-in-law has um, been having some scans and, you know, he's had a couple of symptoms, but basically he's been going pretty good. But they've done some scans and they've discovered with the scans what's really happening on the inside of his body. And they found in various places there's things growing that shouldn't be growing there. And it's like, my goodness. We had no idea. No one had any idea, but the scan, the you know, the X-ray or the you know, what MRIs and different things, they expose what's really happening there. And as Christians, God exposes and convicts us by the Holy Spirit. And in a sense, it's like He turns on the light and He shows us what's hidden. We don't know what's hidden in our thought pattern or our attitude. Sometimes we don't know what's hidden in our motivation or even the things that we do. And we suddenly realise, man, I'm really selfish, you know, or whatever it is. Oh man, I'm really bitter or angry or unforgiving. Or in fact, I hate people. That's my problem. I, I just hate. I, I hate that. I hate that. And it's like my goodness. And and I've been exposed ongoingly that I really lack love sometimes. I I really need somebody to help me. And it's got to be Jesus. It can't just be you or someone else. Because a lot of the time you don't even know what's going on. And there's stuff growing on the inside and in my thoughts and in my attitudes that God wants to deal with. And so I want to look first at the fact that light transforms. We understand if you stick a seed in the ground and put some water on it, but you keep it in darkness, it won't grow. Plants need light, and light causes them to grow. You know, I've got some, uh, some UV resin at home to fix surfboards, and UV resin will not go hard. It'll just be liquid. It'll stay liquid forever unless it's exposed to UV light. But when you expose it to UV light, there's a change. Something happens. Light brings life and causes the resin to do what it's intended to do. In the same way, the Bible says when we're with that cross, we have no spiritual light. We don't have the light of God. We're, we're beating around in the darkness trying to find our way. There's people dabbling and involved in all sorts of uh, religious exploits and spiritual journeys and all sorts of things. But what they come across many times in their darkness, they come across demonic gods and evil spirits and you know things that take them further from God and further from the truth and uh, but God wants to give the light of God and give us understanding light is necessary verse 8 for once you were full of darkness but now you have light from the Lord 
therefore live as people of light. And this is a great picture of transformation that happens to a Christian when we're saved, when we're born again. We realise that God knew all along, but we realise, man, I'm, I'm full of darkness. There's darkness in my life. But now I've got some light from Jesus. The, the first thing that happens when the light comes on is that I'm dark, he's light, I need him. You know, I need to be cleansed of my sin. The word darkness there in that uh, verse in the original Greek word, it's got a sense of a bearer of darkness or an instrument of darkness. And so we were more than just sort of living aimlessly or wandering around in the darkness. We were literally, we weren't for Jesus. We were actually against Jesus. That's what he said. He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering and I realised I was, man, I was, I was on the enemy's side, not intentionally. I wasn't trying to be a you know, Satanist or anything like that. I wasn't trying to oppose Jesus or oppose good or I was trying to do good. But in my stumbling efforts, I was in such darkness that I was spreading and scattering the darkness around. I wasn't helping anybody ultimately with their eternal quest for their life. One commentator said, coming to Christ is like walking from the darkness into a room filled with blazing light. But when you come out of the darkness, you see things that you never saw before. When you lived in the darkness, you did whatever you wanted to do. But now in the light, you must put off the deeds of darkness and put on a lifestyle fitting for the children of light. The Bible talks about the deeds of darkness. We were in darkness and we practice all sorts of habits and deeds and some of it's pride and some of it's selfishness and some of it's greed and some of it's unforgiveness and some of it's you know immorality and drunkenness and all sorts of different things. And maybe not all of those things obviously were relevant to each of us, but some of them might have been. And so now we've got a different goal because we've come out of the darkness. Now we're, we're to carefully determine what pleases the Lord. We can't continue to say, well, uh, if it feels good, I'm going to do it. We can't say everyone else is doing it, therefore I can do it. The light of Christ will affect how we speak, how we act and how we think. God begins to transform us and bring us into the light and transform who we are. And we're no longer free agents making up our own moral choices as we go along. We're called to follow Christ as he brings us into more and more into the light. One commentator said this, he said, We believe there's a God in heaven who's spoken, that his word is authoritative, and he has the absolute right to determine our moral choices which include what we say, what we eat and drink, who we have sex with, how we conduct our business affairs, how we spend our money and all other choices we make in life. I say amen to that, that God has a right to direct us because he knows what's going on. He dwells in unapproachable light. He's not, there's no darkness there with God. God's not taken by surprise. Oh man, what was that? Oh, there's something in the darkness. I didn't realise that we had an infestation of funnel web spiders in the basement. You know, it's like God's not surprised by anything that happens in life, in the world or anywhere. And he sees fully and clearly, he sees right through us. Yeah. Just like an x-ray machine goes, hey, look, there's a broken rib there. Hey, look, there's something there. There's a, there's a dark mass in your lungs or whatever it is. It's like God can see right through everyone and everything. And he is fully involved with our life. He loves us and cares for us, but he wants to transform us from light to light from growth to growth and he wants us that we would end up being or well, in fact we always are even from the start but more and more his ambassadors representing his name and his nature representing who he is and so light secondly light exposes light, ex light exposes sin you know take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness Instead, expose them. You know, it's like you know, it's like you're out trying to you know break into the back door of the house, but suddenly the you know the sensor light comes on. It's like whoa, whoa, whoa and drop your screwdriver and not not me, but you know, <laughs> drop your screwdriver and run because it's like well, you've been exposed. The light is, is suddenly somebody can see you, and as Christians, we begin to understand God sees me all the time, twenty four seven. He sees me. Not he's not there looking at me trying to bust me doing something wrong. He just sees me. He can't not see me. We're exposed. The Bible says that we're fully exposed before God to whom we must give an account. And to me, when I first became a Christian and this 
sense of the exposure to God came upon me and he saw my past and he saw my life and he saw my present. It's like, oh God, forgive me. I, I need a saviour. I, I, I need forgiveness. I, I need your help. And, uh, and it says, you know, Paul says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And that means to discern, to examine, to try, to test and find out by testing and examining and uh, you know, the things that we do, bring it into the light. And I say to people, bring your decisions. What are you planning to do? What are you thinking to do? Bring your decisions into the light and compare them with the word of God. Your word brings light, the Bible says. And so we can understand, should I say this? Should I not say this? Should I do this? Should I not do this? And we can bring it and allow it and bring it before God and allow God to shine some light on it. And I don't know about you, but I've been planning to say or do something sometimes. And it's like when I bring it to God in prayer or when I bring it to God and begin to read the word of God, and it's just like, oh yeah, that wasn't right. God shows you some stuff. He shows you what's right, but he also wrong, but he also shows you what's right. And he shows you what you should do. And he gives you understanding of what's happening. The Living Bible says, learn as you go along what pleases the Lord. Learn as you go along. And this is what a Christian life is. We follow Jesus. We don't know everything all at once. You know, if, if, if the lights came on and we, you know, it's like, man, we couldn't cope. It's like computer overload. It's like but bit by bit he will expose and bring into the light different areas of our life that he wants to focus on, that he wants to help us with. When I invited Jesus into my life, the next day I woke up, the next day, seriously, and he exposed and revealed things that were pleasing and not pleasing. And I used to smoke bongs with these guys. I was living in a caravan and they'd drop around for a visit in the morning and smoke some pot with me. And and uh, and as I sat there and the guys, you know, chopped up some pot and, you know, packed a few cones and passed it around, I just knew it was wrong. I just knew it was not pleasing to God. And I was a little bit of, I was going to maybe be a little bit of a Rastafarian type of Christian, you know. Um, and... Uh, but when I was there, it's like, this is not right to the point. And somebody handed me the bong and I held a bong and I'd smoke count, like, like I'm talking tens of thousands of bongs. Oh, that explains it, Pastor. Um, lots of, lots of bongs. And, and I'm holding this bong and I'm holding a lighter and it's like I'd never had one in my whole life before. That's how I felt. I felt clean and I felt new and I felt fresh and I felt like I was in the light. And I looked at it and I just went, I don't want it. And gave it back and the guy's immediate response was man you went to that church last night <laughs> and I said yeah I did and they said uh, well man they're trying to they're trying to you know and I said nobody mentioned smoking bombs <laughs> nobody said anything but right now as I, as I sit here I said I feel like he's t- saying something to me and he's saying you don't need a Pete I've got something better for your life pass it on and, and I did that and then the guys are there and they're using Jesus name as a swear word they're, they're, they're blaspheming they're using Jesus name as a, a cuss word and um, every time someone did it I'd sort of almost, almost physically cringe I'm going oh, oh like I'm, I'm just and I'm about to say man this is wrong and then I did it I said man can you can you not do that and, I, and one of the guys goes what I said um, like Jesus you, you, you're blaming him for everything like you're using his name like you know it's a swear word and, and, and they just looked at me and went man you've lost it and I said, well, either that or I found it. <laughs> because I used to speak like that. The day before, I used to speak like that. The week before, the month before, I used to speak like that all the time. It was normal for me. That was the culture that I, I was... It's, it's Australia, man. That's how we speak about our God. <laughs> you know, it's it's like, what? And, 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 and I was just under conviction. The light had come on. It's like, no, I've, and, and I've never done it since that time. I've never used Jesus' name as a swear word since that time because the light came on. It's like, that's wrong. I didn't need, no one told me. No, no, no one said, man, there's the scripture, this is what it says. Even though it is in the Bible, you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain. But God spoke, spoke to me, God showed me. And, um, and much to my shame, you know, I used to look after the um, amenities block and there was a big boiler and I used to stoke the fire. And so I've gone down to stoke the fire and put some wood in and stuff. And a girl came out of the the, you know, the female amenities block and she's, you know, she's had a shower and she's got a towel wrapped around her. And as she walked past, I naturally, sorry guys, but naturally I just looked at her. 
and in you know in a pervy sort of way, and I'm checking her out, and I'm checking out her backside. Um, that's what I did. That's that's what my dad did. That's what my mates did. That's what people in Australia do. That's what men do. That's like we're men. We're men. We look at girls as they walk past, and we lust after them. And it's like that's normal in our culture, and, and that's what I've been taught. And my carnal man agreed with that. But yeah, yeah, that's a good thing to do. And I did that. And as I'm doing it, I was suddenly mortified and horrified and shocked that it's like, what am I doing? That's so disrespectful to that girl. Why are you looking at her like that? And I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm ashamed. I've done it my whole life. <laughs> I've done it every day for years. Not every day. But I did, you know, <laughs> for a long time, that was natural and normal. And I'm just, and, but I'm, and I'm like, oh, and I thought, imagine if she had a father. How would he feel about me looking at her like that? He'd think, man, you're a scumbag, bro. Like, what's wrong with you? Even that or he's an Aussie and he'd say, hey, good on you, mate. You know, I don't know. But um, seriously, it's like the light had come on and it's like there's things in my life. And I, I've told people that testimony many times. It's like no one told me, stop doing that. But God told me and he still tells me, don't do that. But listen, do this. Can you do this? Will you do that? Will you do this? And tells me good things to do. And that involves following Christ's example and walking in the light. Other things I was doing, I was in the darkness. But I didn't know that I was in the darkness until the light came on. Yes, yes. Suddenly the, the, you know, the brightness came up. And so Paul tells us, you know, don't, don't dabble in sin. We got no part in that. Doing, you know, worth. They're worthless. They're, they're not valuable. They're not good. They're not healthy. Those things. That's bad for you. That sort of stuff. And um, you know, but you know, we're not to adapt or adopt rather the standards of the world. We're not to follow the world's ways or our culture's way because a lot of it, they're people just living in darkness. Just because the majority do it doesn't make anything right. The majority of people in Nazi Germany in World War Two did what? They were, they were blind, the blind leading the blind. And so secondly, light exposes the sin in others, exposes our sin, exposes the sin in others. And uh, and Paul says we're actually to expose those dark deeds. Does that mean we're to go to unbelievers and point out their sin? And so listen, mate, you know, should we go down now after the service down to the pub and walk in and find some people? So listen, buddy, you're drunk. Is, is that what it's saying? Is that where to do expose their their deeds? You know, it's like what, what what does that mean? Um, and I don't think that that's what Jesus did because he was a friend to sinners. He mixed with the the drunks and the the prostitutes and the people that were broken and lost and in darkness. Um, but he did speak against sin publicly. He did expose sin in his public ministry. And uh, when light, you know, and when light is clearly seen, it begins to expose the darkness in people's hearts and lives. And I've had people, because I've acted in a gracious way towards somebody, accuse me of trying to do something bad. It's like, what? And I used to get amazed how people get convicted um, or try really hard to get you to agree to join them. And, and I remember at a work, um, you know, office party, this guy said, I can't enjoy my beer because you're not having a beer. It's like, oh, sorry, man. <laughs> I'm not going to have it. I, I don't drink anymore because I, I feel like God's just not into it. God doesn't want me to do that. I'm not going to do that. Sorry about that. And, uh, and people get convicted by what they do because you're not doing the same thing. You're not doing it. And, and I used to get guys at, uh, at work and they used to say, yeah, man, just look at that girl. Look at that girl walking past. You know, they're on a building site. And I'm going, no, I don't want to look at the girl. I've got a wife, man. Why would I want to look at some girl? That's, that's not right. That's disrespectful. And these guys used to get really upset. But the truth is, I got really upset with Christians myself in the same way, <laughs> you know, years before. John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. That's Jesus. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may clearly be seen 
that they've been done in God. The world doesn't want the light, but it desperately needs the light. You know, and uh, you know the old story is, is listen. The Bible says we're going to give an account before God. There's going to be we're exposed before God. We're going to give an account. And imagine if every bad thing you ever did was suddenly played up on that screen. There, we, we'd all just go, oh, what? You know, have you got footage, Pastor? No, I don't have any footage of you. You know, not interested. But before God, God's going to replay it to us personally and say, so what's the story? And we're going to condemn ourselves. We're going to go, oh God. Get away from me, I'm a sinful man. God, forgive me. But he wants to bring that conviction before we stand before him on Judgment Day, that we would go, I'm just getting a bit of light here, and, and, and I'm serious. The Apostle Paul, he, he begins, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. And in the process of time, he says, you know, I'm, I'm the least of the believers. And in the, in the process of time, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. And was Paul getting worse? You know, was Paul starting to drink more or smoke more cigarettes or what was he doing? No, he was just getting more light and more revelation and he saw, it's like, he's he's far better than I thought and I'm far worse than I thought. Yes. And I'm not saying we have to feel, I'm not preaching this, we feel bad about ourselves, pastors try and make us feel bad about ourselves. It's like, God convicts us so that we come to a place of godly repentance. We go, no, that's not right. That's wrong. I'm in darkness. I'm going to judge that in myself. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that. And it sets us free because sin's darkness. Sin's a weight. Sin's a heavy, heavy thing in our life. Goes on in the text and says, look, some some things shouldn't be spoken about in public. And it says, verse 12, it's shameful even to think, speak of those things which are done by them in secret. And one commentator said, no doubt Paul has in, in his mind the various rituals associated with the temple of Artemis, also called Diana, located in Ephesus. That's what he's speaking to these people in this city. And they had a big temple there in the city. And, uh, you know, they're involved in uh, sexual practices, temple rituals, all sorts of things. And when people... Paul speaks of things done in secret. He's talking about, you know, some of the vile things that they got involved in. He says, we don't have to talk about that stuff. That's that's evil, it's gross, it's perverted, it's it's bad stuff. He says, but we need to have nothing to do with that, but expose it for what it is by living a pure life and by at times condemning it rather than just normalising it, rather than just desensitising. There's stuff that's betrayed in the mainstream news feed that's perverted. This stuff portrayed and, and even become law in our society, it's uh, it's not right. It shouldn't be normalised, that's okay, that's normal. No, it's not. It's sin, it's wickedness, it's darkness. And, uh, and, and the church more and more will be persecuted for speaking out about those sorts of things. And you more and more in the workplace and in society and with maybe even your extended family, if you speak about things, they'll, they'll call you all sorts of things. They'll, they'll be upset about you. You'll be the hater. You'll be the bad guy in the situation. Uh, that's just the way that it is. And we shouldn't be surprised when some people resent us for shining the light of God's truth. You know, who are you to judge me? Who are you to... Well, the fact is, I, I, I'm nobody. I've got no standing to judge anybody. But God calls me to shine the light of his truth. And God wants his truth to um, be exposed to to people and allow the Holy Ghost to convict them. The Bible says the Holy Ghost convicts the whole world of sin. That's one of the jobs. He's the comforter. He's a teacher. But he wants to convict people of their sin and expose that it's wrong. And we remember that the Word of God, the Bible says, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, okay, double-edged sword, that doesn't sound... You know, you ever play with a double-edged sword? It's like your kids put it down, you're going to hurt yourself. It's, it's a bit intense. It cuts through all the nonsense. It exposes all the lies. It reveals all the deception. And it lays, bears the, lays bare the evil in every human heart. And uh, I tell people, it's like there is evil in every single human heart. There is rebellion to God in every single human heart. There is an unwillingness to submit and surrender to our creator, our all-powerful creator. We want to have the reins. We want to have control for ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. Who said I can't do that? I want to, I want to do what I want to do. And uh, who are you to tell me? Who? And, and people get upset, but more than just upset with you or me or, or, or the scripture, they get upset with God. And people for a long, long, long time have hated the scripture. They want to, they, they'd love to banish it. They'd love to banish Christians, stop saying this stuff. It hurts to be cut with a sword. And so no wonder people don't like straight or strong preaching 
or what the word of God says. This is what it says. The truth hurts. And many times it'll hurt you before it heals you. And this applies to us believers as much as it applies to anybody else. And the same light that exposes the evils of society also exposes our own hypocrisy. Who's ever been exposed? It's like there's a bit of hypocrisy there. It's like, oh, our secret sins, our pride, our sinful ambition, our sexual compromise, our love of money, our need for power, our lust for approval and all the other hidden idols of the heart. The truth will hurt you before it heals you. But light, God sends light to transform our life. God sends light to expose things in our life. And thirdly, light awakens. And so who knows when it's suddenly, you know, if you don't have your curtains drawn and stuff, it's like when, it, when, when it's day, it's like you usually wake up. So like, oh, it's the light. And uh, it causes people to, <coughs> pardon me, to rise from the dead. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in the uh, article I read out earlier about, you know, the census in Australia and the, uh, the, the drop-off in numbers of believers and Christians, let me read this for a moment. It's a peculiarity or peculiarly Western phenomena. Elsewhere, religion is booming. The heart of Christianity has shifted from Europe to Africa and Latin America. Officially, atheist China has experienced what's been called a Christian revival. It's now estimated that by 2030, China may have the world's largest Christian population. And despite what the census tells us is happening here, Christianity is not dying. Pew research uh, shows that uh, in the century between 1910 and 2010, the number of Christians grew from 600 million to more than 2 billion. And that's why our fellowship sends churches into all the world and particularly sends churches into wherever it's open or wherever it's happening. If there's a bit of revival, there's, there's, there's openness to the gospel. Let's send more people in there. They're open. And listen, we're not, it's not that we're not going to send churches into Australia or the UK or America or somewhere because people do get saved and people can. And we're believing for a last day's revival. But the fact is it's happening in, in the Pacific. It's happening in China. It's happening in different nations in Africa. It's happening in South America. It's happening in different places. And so the light of the gospel is going in just like the Apostle Paul says, listen, I'm going to take the gospel to the Gentiles because you Jews don't want to listen. And so he brings the gospel and there's a revival amongst non, non-Jewish um, people getting saved. And so that's exactly what's happening. There is a shift in the world. There is a lack of openness. It's people have been inoculated and immunized against Christianity. And sometimes it's through the failings of the church and the failings of Christians in inverted commas to live in the light and walk in the light they're as big a hypocrite as somebody else they're sometimes worse you know the abuse of children the the, the immorality the greed the all it's like my goodness that's horrific no wonder people don't want to know about that but at the same time for people searching for truth if we will represent to at least some degree who Christ is which adds weight to the words and to our testimony people may become interested in Christ himself and be open and become uh, humbled by the goodness of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to the point of salvation. The gospel works, the gospel transforms, and the gospel raises from the dead. The Bible says we must be born again. And so, in a sense, it talks about baptism. It says we died with Christ. And we're raised out of the water. And that's symbolic of we died with Christ when he was crucified on the cross and we raised again when he rose from the dead. And we're born again to a whole new life. One that we've been forgiven of our sins, that we've got a new start. And it says in our text, Awake, O sleep, arise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And so how can a man raise from the dead? Sounds like a bit of a supernatural thing, doesn't it? How can I be raised from the dead? Well, ask Lazarus. It's like, well, he didn't do anything. He couldn't do anything. He just obeyed the voice of the Lord that raised him from the dead. Jesus did it. And when the light of the gospel comes in, it wakes up the spiritually dead and draws them to Jesus. I had lots of spiritual practices. I travelled through India. I read lots of books. I practised lots of things. I went to lots of temples. I did lots of stuff. But I was spiritually dead and in darkness. That was the sum result of a decade of searching. And, uh, and I came to Christ and in a moment's time and ongoingly there's been light come into my life and he's been exposing things and he's been leading me and he's been helping me and it's like, oh, thank God. 
no longer wandering around banging my head in the dark. Ever waking up in the middle of the night and it's, you know, my, my wife in Western Australia is a blackout. And uh, seriously, I'm, I, I stumble into things when the light's on, but when there's a blackout, I always get my little toe and uh, I always bump my head in the doorway and it's like, seriously, I just get worked over. It's like, man, the dark and me don't go real good together. And that, that's symbolic of life. It's like, uh, I don't prosper unless God's helping me. Unless God's lighting the way, unless God reveals some stuff, it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. And so the text shows us what happens when the light of God begins to shine. First, the light shines on us and transforms us from darkness to light. It's like we were in darkness, now there's some light. Oh, thank God. New believers, you can be saved and you can be born again, but there's just a little bit of light. And they're, they're, they're seeing some things and it takes time. It's a process. Some people get born again, they just have a radical experience. It's like the light, the floodlights are gone. It's a footy stadium. It's like, whoa. And you can, you can see so much and there's incredible revelation. Everyone's different, but God will reveal and there'll be light. Second, the light shining through us chases away the darkness and exposes the evil done under the cover of night. And third, the light awakens those who are asleep and raises them from the dead. This is why Paul boldly preached the gospel in the very heart of the ancient world, in Corinth and Ephesus, in Athens and Rome. These are places of great idolatry, great demonic strongholds in cities. And Paul knew that if God could reach him, if God could shine light on him, and he knew that when even if the gospel is preached and it shines in a society, the light will expose some people and make them angry. That's why wherever he went, there was usually a riot. There were those crowds stirred up. There was opposition towards him. Um, you know, he got beaten up. He got run out of town. He got thrown in prison. All sorts of things happened. But the same light will awaken some others to their need of Christ and they'll respond to Jesus and go, thank you, Paul, for preaching that message. It's true. I need a saviour. I need Jesus Christ and they'll be born again. And so as I said, you know, light can make some people get angry. You turn on the light on someone who's asleep, they might yell at you. <laughs> they may not appreciate it. It's like, what, what, what? And I remember a guy, one time I worked with this guy and he got really angry at me because I was telling him about Jesus and I was praying for him and he got really upset until he got saved. And then he was really, really thankful. I said, come on, man. Like, one minute you hate me, one minute you love me. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah. He was in darkness. And God calls us to be light bearers. God calls us to bring the light of the gospel to bear. We need to be wise and we don't want to just go out and yell at people and tell them they're wicked sinners and uh, tell tell a blind man that he's blind. It's like that's not necessarily going to bring hope. But we can tell people about Jesus and we can tell people about what happened in our life. So as I close, when uh, Robert Louis Stevenson was a young child, he was sick um, much of the time. And he couldn't go out and play like the other children, so he spent a lot of time watching at the window. Here's his child, he's a sick child, and uh, couldn't go out to play. He wasn't a normal kid, he didn't have a normal experience anyway, but um, he spent a lot of time watching at the window. And one evening, uh, he sat and watched as a man came down the street lighting the gas lamps. They used to have gas lamps in England back in the day and you'd turn on the light and light the gas lamp in the night and they'd be, they, they were the street lights they didn't have a switch that they flick somewhere, they were gas lights and his nurse said to him what are you doing? And he said I'm watching the man knock holes in the darkness, he replied what an what interesting perception, an interesting phrase, I'm watching the man knock holes in the darkness there is darkness in this world. The Bible says the devil, the prince of darkness, has the the whole world under his influence. And, uh, and, and the world and people are in darkness, they don't know. But listen, some people are knocking holes in the darkness and there's, there's light appearing. And if you're in England back in the day, you'd be so appreciative that the man I can walk home safely and not get mugged and not get bashed or you know, Jack the Ripper's not going to jump out. Because there's, there's somebody's knocking holes in the darkness. There's some light there for me. And that's what we want to do as a, as a ministry, as a fellowship, and as individual Christians. We want to knock hole in, holes in the darkness. And people historically have been saved all over the world out of all sorts of cultures and backgrounds, out of all sorts of practices. And they've come to the light of Christ because someone's willing to stand up like the Apostle Paul. And, and not only did he do it, but he challenged the people that received Christ that you need to do that. Don't, don't 
dabble in the darkness. Don't, you know, live the same way as everybody else. Don't live the same way as you used to. Walk in the light. God's got a whole new life for you. It's a better life. It's a better morality. It's it's God's way and it makes a difference. And other people, if you'll be a lamp on a stand, if you'll be the light of the world, people can come to Christ. People can come to me. They're, they're not going to go to heaven. People can come to me. It may not even solve any of their problems, but they can come to Christ through me and through you and we can make a difference. Matthew 5, I'll finish with this scripture, 14, um, 15 and 16. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're called to knock holes in the darkness. We were made for times such as this. Praise God. Let's bow our heads before God for a moment. God's a good God. God wants to doesn't want us to be stuck in the darkness, in the dark ages, in the you know, the dark practices, the dark attitudes, the, the dark moods, the, the things of darkness. He wants to bring us into light. He wants to bring us to a place of hope. And it's a process. It's you know, it, it begins with a response to him saying, God, I want your light. I, I need light in my life. I need you to help me, Jesus. I need you to help me. That's my prayer every day. Jesus, I need you to help me. I need you to take me by the hand. I need you to illuminate and bring some light into some situations. There's some things that happen in my heart that aren't right. I need you to shine your light in there. And the Word of God, the Bible says, it's like a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It shows us where we're at right now, where our feet are standing. And it's a light to our path. It'll show us, illuminate down the track where we're headed. What a great picture what, what, what a great understanding that's the word of god and i found it to be 100 percent true freeing the powerful word of god that can bring light to our dark world thank god for his love jesus came into the world the light of the world thank god for his great love he wants to rescue us he wants to help us I want to give you an opportunity tonight. You come here tonight and the Holy Spirit's convicting you. It's like, God, I, I need your light. I, I need forgiveness. There's been darkness in my life. There's, there's some areas that I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need you to lead me by your word, by your spirit, by your light, Jesus. I need you to lead me tomorrow. This week, this month, this year, I need you to lead me to heaven. The Bible says there's a place of utter darkness. It's called hell. There's a place where there's light, where God himself is the light. It says there's no need for any sun or moon. God is the light. It's light all the time. Nothing's going to be hidden. Nothing's going to be misunderstood or misrepresented. It's just going to be out in the open. It's going to be clear and it's going to be pure. It's going to be holy and right. It's going to be truthful. Thank God for his goodness. And maybe you're here tonight and, and you recognize, Pastor, I need the light of God in Jesus. So I, I, want to, I want to commit my life to follow the light. I want to commit my life to Jesus. I, I want the forgiveness of Christ to wash away all my sins and allow him access to my life. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I, I want to pray a prayer like that. Is there anybody here tonight? That's you. You want to pray a real simple prayer. I need the forgiveness, the grace, the love of God. I need the light of Christ in my life. I need the light of God. You know, many years ago, we went fishing off the coast of WA and we went out at night, went out in a boat, we went you know, several kilometres out to sea. We threw down the anchor and we, uh, we were moored off the, the town where we'd gone out from and we saw the lights there and we were all good, but we got distracted and we were doing our fishing thing and we caught a few fish and we were out there for several hours and then suddenly we looked up and the shoreline was completely black. And uh, it wasn't because it was a blackout, it wasn't because everyone had gone to bed, it was because our anchor had slipped and we were drifting and we didn't even realise it. 
and uh, it was complete darkness and we didn't know whether we drifted north or south and we began to test the current and it's like, okay, it looks like we're going north and, you know, uh, you know, if we go 25 kilometres, there'll be another town, we'll be able to find the lights and make our way in there. We didn't know whether we are going to try and come in over a reef or what it is and it was just such a treacherous adventure, if you could call it that. It was a little bit foolish, to be honest. But life's a bit like that. And we were risking our life and we were basically adrift at sea in the dark. Could have died, could have been lost, could have been another statistic. But by the grace of God, we all prayed, we were Christians, we all prayed, God help us. <laughs> God help us to get to shore. Help us to find our way back. God give us some light. And we, we found some lights and we came in you know, many kilometres away from where we started. Maybe you're adrift and maybe you, you, God's speaking to you and you need Christ and you want to receive him tonight. Is there anybody at all you want to pray a prayer like that? That's me, Pastor. I want to pray a prayer like that. I need God's help in my life. I need Jesus. Anybody at all? Maybe you're tuning in online. I want to pray with you. Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus, the light of the world. I want to confess that I'm a sinner and I've... I've done things in ignorance, I've done things in darkness, I've done things that I knew were wrong I confess and I'm a sinner but I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin pray this prayer I repent of my sin and receive Jesus as my Lord and Saviour come into my life and teach me your ways Amen if you pray that prayer you can contact us, we want to help you but God's real. He loves you. He knows you. He wants to shine a light upon your life. He wants to lead you forward out of the darkness and into the life, into good things. Maybe God's been speaking to you tonight about the fact that we can make a difference. We can be uh, people that punch holes in the darkness. We can bring the light of Christ and make a difference in our workplace, in our family, in our, in our home. We can make a difference by the decisions that we make, the, the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we pray, the way that the things that we do, we're, we're different people. We're called to be different. And people, some might not like that, some will be ambivalent to that, but some will say, man, like, how must I be saved? Man, what is it about you? What about you? Man, can I come to your church? Can I, can I, can I have a Bible? Can I, can I hear more? Because we can walk in the light. It's because of the goodness of God. It's because of Christ. But we have a, a role to play and a part to play in that. Our decisions, our actions make a difference. Praise God. The altar's open. I want to invite you to come and pray tonight. Spend some time. A light in the darkness. God's called us to be light bearers. God's called us to make a difference in the world. And there's so many in darkness. That we live in a world that's in darkness. It's like... People don't know their right hand from their left hand. People don't know what they're doing. But God knows what he's doing. God wants to help us. Wonderful God. Wonderful God. He's going to sing that song for us.
God in the darkness, wonderful God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I appreciate you coming out tonight. We're going to close off with a word of prayer. And I pray this has been a help. Blessing to you. Can you um, can ask Jeff to uh, to pray? Close off the word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you. We can gather together and hear this word tonight, Father. I thank you for your light, Lord, that illuminates, Lord, that brings revelation, that lights the path that you have us to walk, Lord. I pray that you help us to be faithful to respond, Father, faithfully to what you show us, Lord, and, and as you lead us, we follow, Lord. I pray that you keep us this to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. God bless you. Bless your week.